So, yes. Hello, my name is Mario Klingemann and I will be talking about uh, the joy of order. And uh, as if you have not guessed from my accent, the title might be a giveaway. I'm from Germany. <laughs> and, uh, well, I'm a code artist, which means uh, I'm not really a programmer and not really an artist, but I'm building my own tools using code and programming. And also I'm trying to actually teach the computer to create art by itself, by writing <laughs> algorithms. But yes, I'm not about here to show much of my art today, but rather my kind of other side, my dark side, because I'm also an obsessive compulsive orderer. And uh, the best example is when I'm going on holiday and I'm at the beach, then uh, it first looks like this. And then uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I simply have to find out like how things are made. And also the whole process of putting things in order is, is really like kind of, almost like a Zen kind of thing to do. So yes, you, you see what the beach is made of. And uh, oh yeah, that's the best part. So, well, and I was always wondering like, why, why actually, why does it so much fun for me to put things in order? And I figured out it's actually not the ordering itself so much, but rather that the thing that I call the joy of finding. And uh, so, and when you put things, like when you start building up a kind of sorting order or like a system, how to sort things, then whenever you find something that fits that system, you get a little bit more, you get happy. And I'm sharing that with lots of other people, like train spotters, cat ladies, stamp collectors, <laughs> or jigsaw puzzlers. Because yes, uh, all of these, like, if you have a collection and then you find something, then yes, it's, uh, it, it, it gives you this short moment of happiness. And uh, actually, I also think that it's not about f like owning the collection, it's really about that finding. And the reason is that we are all dopamine junkies. <laughs> thing is like they actually the that process of finding is actually hardwired into our brains it's part of that what you call it like the the reptile brain and like if birds pick up uh, seeds or something they might find something or when you were roaming through the woods and found those two berries sticking out so yes you always get this kind of little bit of a reward whenever you find something so and that's why I'm in it so I, I realized I'm building everything always to get a little bit of that kick but yes, we live in these times when it's actually hard to find things, new things. I mean, we are not back in the days where you could travel out in the world and have the chance to find actual dragons somewhere. <laughs> but well, fortunately, the Beetle Digital Project came along and uh, the one million images. And when that came out, I, a whole new world opened up where you could actually find dragons or other things. And especially in the early days, when it was still like fresh and you went on Flickr, you sometimes went through the collection and it showed you this thing had just one view. It means you were the first one to actually rediscover this image after it had been somewhere lying for, of course, probably some people had went to the library and found it, but it, it felt good. Like, oh my God, this is beautiful and I'm the first one to see it. So I, I really like that. But yes, uh, as well, if you have browsed the Flickr collection, well, you saw this one issue with it that, well, there is no order at all in it. I mean, if you want to really find something, you would have to like go, go through every image by image and hope for serendipity to, well, to actually find those things that you, that you were looking for. So I thought like, okay, that's a great kind of task. How can I put some kind of order to this? And uh, I had already, kind of a project before that in my attempts to write programs that create pictures that look like art. It's called Sketchmaker and it's a, well, I don't show that now, but it's kind of trying like randomly creating images and then try to find out how artsy is that image. And in order to define that factor, how artsy is this, I had to, to build this system which where I could go through like images that are like accepted to be art and try to measure them and and rate them in a way. So I had built this tool which where I loaded in a bunch of like images from an art collection and then it would try to find already similarities and clusters in there. So 
And uh, well, actually, that that worked in some parts, not too bad. So you can see it already clustered things that look similar together. And this one doesn't show this stuff that is not art, but like if you have just noise or a picture of a soccer game, that would end up in a different cluster. And then I could say this cluster is eight points of 10 art, and this is zero. And so, yeah, this is all based on kind of my own secret sauce, whatever you call it, uh, image analysis uh, classifier. And I, I quickly go into it because some people might be interested. So I'm using a 127 dimensional feature vector. And uh, that is just a, it, the number sounds like, oh yeah, it somehow has something to do with uh, bytes or so, but it's actually just a coincidence that it's, and what I'm doing, I'm just looking at global features and images. I'm, uh, if you are like, uh, oh, if you saw the, the talk before by Ian, he showed you all these features things with the lines, which is using either thing called SIFT or SURF, I guess, which is looking really for these configurations within an image. I'm not doing that. I'm really just looking at global features like brightness distributions, colors, and edges and everything, and I always put them in histograms because histograms have, can then again be turned into single numbers. And the other thing is I'm treating these images like textures, and textures have also certain measures where you look at neighboring pixels and how do they interact with each other. And all of these allow you to always condense an entire image, parts, aspects of it into single numbers. And in the end, I have 127 numbers which tell me something about an image. A single one doesn't really tell you much, but if you put them all together, then you can measure distances between images and say, well, this and that image are more similar than this and this. And so I then started to build my own tools to wade through the collection. And, uh, and well, it starts up obviously because uh, I don't, didn't get that hard drive. I actually have to go to Flickr and uh, download them one by one. But fortunately, there is this already a kind of a, on, on GitHub, Ben showed this before, a list like where all the images are located. Because Flickr has these limitations where you are only allowed to do that amount, a certain amount of requests per minute. And so this helps to reduce the amount of requests. Not sure if I should actually, well, let me see if it works, if the internet is working, but I quickly show my tool number one. That sometimes does not work. Uh, oh, the hard drive is still has to still, yeah, it always goes asleep. So, ah, there we go. So this is the amazing tool because I only build it for myself. So this is actually then trying to download, like downloads a single image. Let's see if it works. Sometimes it does, sometimes not. So it will download an image from Flickr, a random one from the whole list and then run my analyzer over it and uh, save that kind of 127 dimensional number on my hard drive. I'm not actually using any databases because if you, I, I don't, because it runs on this machine, I'm not running it on a distributed system somewhere, so I don't trust like having to load a, like a several gigabyte big database in memory. Well, we come to that later. Okay, so this one does not do it not now, but sometimes it does. That's not really important. Just what it does is, so let's go here, British Library. It downloads the images into my image folder because that's the other thing I'm doing. I'm just using Explorer. Like I'm not even building out my own tool to, to kind of uh, take, administrate the images. I'm just using my folder. So what it does, it just downloads them into a folder randomly and saves the other images in the, in a kind of an analytics folder here where it contains then thousands of these files which uh, each of this is this kind of fingerprint of a single image. And um, well, the next step is I have to kind of first of course go like with the art thing first and tell it, okay, there are certain categories in it. And I'm so what I did is I'm just manually went through these images on the folder. Let's go here. And so this is an unsorted folder now, which actually I freshly downloaded yesterday. So I have no idea really what's in it. And what I'm doing is I'm just saying, okay, this is a, this is a building. I put it into my training folder 
which contains architecture. And then I take other pictures and starting to build up kind of rough categories, like this is colorful, this is architecture, this is animals, this is decorative, animal, uh, decorative elements. And uh, then so you can see, for example, I collected a set of colorful architecture pictures. Next step is, well, that's the first thing I tried, and I had to learn this for this purpose. I went and used the programming language called R, which is very kind of like specialized in wading through big data and has lots of kind of very, like once you understood it, it's rather simple to do data analysis with it. So in, in R, you feed kind of these, these are an image in numbers. You feed it in and then you write a few lines of code and you train a classifier. So for example, I analyzed the entire folder which contains architecture and then it tries to figure out what makes a photo that contains architecture different from one that contains animals. So that was the naive idea I had that how this should work. And uh, I, there are several ways of doing this. <coughs> and I went for random forests, which is one, like one technique to, to do this classifiers. The other one is called support vector machines. And I tried both. I went for random forests then. And the initial results were not too bad, actually. So this is, for example, like after I trained it to recognize maps, I gave it a bunch of unclassified images. It went through it and said, OK, this is what I think are all the maps in this, uh, in this collection. And well, you can see, like I marked it here. Uh, this is not. This is not but the rest. It's all maps. So that was not too bad, actually. So. Unfortunately, oh yeah, and here, well, with portraits, works nice, and uh, sometimes you get these little errors, which of course are also fun to watch. Um, well, the, the R approach had some downsides for me, which is like, first of all, if I train it with like a few thousand images, that always took like half an hour or an hour, and then I had to do it in different categories. The other problem I found even more limiting is that our li I can only use about 30 different categories in one training set with the random forests. <laughs> and well, the worst thing is that like, it worked really nice with musical notes and uh, certain other things like maps, uh, decorative elements, but then like, it totally failed in distinguishing, let's say, animals from plants or architecture. So those all landed in a big blob. So, I tried to figure out why is that so. And uh, well, then I realized, OK, so if I put just all these architectural images, like the simple ones and the complex ones, into one kind of classifier, you can imagine it's like uh, this, this kind of weird cloud, which gets more and more bigger and bigger and has more, well, you could call it also a gravity field, maybe. And you, the more different things you have in there, the more different things you will also attract and also, in a way, the, the wrong kind of things that you don't want. So I have to split the, the big cloud into smaller clusters, which uh, unfortunately was not really possible with the approach I used before. But then I discovered this really nice technique, which is called T as an E clustering. And it's usually a clustering technique used more to do data visualization. Like people say, oh yeah, it's not really well for regular clustering of things <coughs> like, uh, because there is k-means and spectral clustering and stuff. But I, I, I really, I really like, uh, like the, the final result of it because I'm kind of visual. I always have to, to visualize the things I'm doing. And let me quickly show you how, what that does because that is a really, Nice kind of effect. So here's the other tool, <laughs> very, very bland. And let's, so what I'm doing is I, I'm using a little, a few less. So let's, let's I, I pick up 400 images from the, that kind of, oh, that hard drive always goes to sleep again, just a second. And uh, let's, yeah, let's take the UC2, which contains 3,000 images, and I'm just loading 400 from them first into this thing. So we have just have to wait for a few more seconds. As you can see, it's, well, the interesting thing, you don't see any decorative elements here and, and things because when I'm 
I have to pre-cluster, like, like I'm downloading 20,000 images, and it, I learned that after like about 10,000 images, the, that Explorer approach where I have lots of files in a single folder gets really slow. So what I'm doing is I'm chopping it up into blocks of 3,000. So each of my unclassified folders contain 3,000 images. And then because of the copying process, there's already a pre-selection happening because it somehow p takes first the biggest files into the first folder, then next. So, and the image size is already kind of an interesting uh, kind of factor in what the image actually contains in a way stuff that compresses more as a JPEG or so has often a very different content than uh, some, something that doesn't compress as well. Okay, so here we go. So now we have all these images and what I'm doing now, I start the, the TSNE clustering pro process and let's, which is in a way, it takes the differences between all the, all the images that are in the box, like that are there, like, yeah, the difference between each image between each other, and then it tries to separate them so the more similar ones stick closer together. And as you can see, it already kind of does a, a really nice job there. Let's see what have we got here. It's kind of a colorish cover. Then here, and you must excuse the resolution because for performance, I, I'm of course not using the, the high res image for this clustering. Usually there was this kind of uh, here down here, for example, you see it already grouped these portraits from which are in a similar style together, photographs, and here I think we have a map, uh, or here collections of objects, for example. So this does all the work already for me in a really nice way. Um, what I can do next, of course, so I really do get this kind of uh, spatial distributed stuff. So how do I get this back to folders? So what I'm doing is I'm, uh, creating a, a Voronoi diagram, so, which kind of connects, and then I'm saying connect me, connect this image to the closest neighbor that is actually located next to you. And so you get this structure where nearest neighbors are connected to each other, but sometimes the nearest neighbor to image A is a different one than to B, like, or A is connected to B, but B has a closer neighbor C, and then you get these chains. And what I can do next, is I can say, put them back to clusters, and I um, have already kind of these a th a thematic sort which with images that look similar. And if I don't want the, like, that, but you see sometimes there are clusters not connected which should be together, like this and this looks very similar. So I can uh, repeat the process with the entire cluster. And I say cluster to cluster, and uh, here we go, so now I get I have about like eight clusters which are somehow visually similar. And oh, the one thing you see here, this is actually like where an image was supposed to be there, but it's not, so, but I can filter them out automatically too. So what's the next step? Um, oh yeah, how am I doing time? Oh, hmm? Okay, good, because quick digress digression, uh, what I also did was use the same TSNE clustering algorithm to, to do a kind of thematic map of, of the book subjects in the Internet Archive. Well, because the Internet Archive did a very similar thing, like the British Library, they also uploaded a few million pictures to Flickr, and because they have already kind of book categories from the books they, these images came from, there are lots of tags which, for example, says this image is a medical image and it's, uh, I don't know, veterinary medicine. So every image contains about five or six category tags. And what I did is then I, I made distances between images based on like how many tags they share in common. And then just mapping in a way these distances, the tags back to this map. And what you can get here is then this kind of tag map. Uh, I should have put in the power supply. So. Let's zoom in. So for example, here you see railroad, then you have technical stuff, telephone, and whenever, so when I roll over telephone, it will highlight all the other tags, which like when an image with a telephone appears, it has also kind of often these other tags connected to it. And then you could click on that image and it will actually search on Flickr for 
all these tags. And so it's pretty much really using this <coughs> TSNE algorithm, which I really like, because it's in a way also creating this natural organic look. And uh, well, this is actually not even the whole collection, but at a, some point I ran out of memory. That's always the problem, memory, and I don't have this huge machine. <laughs> so, okay, but back to the kind of how do I then sort my stuff? Because I want this process of finding things also in a way like the same like I'm sorting the beach because I, I want to go through this whole unsorted mass and then like be happy when I find something. So while well, I call this the limed twig or cherry picking, in a way I'm starting with a single category, let's say the um, maps, maps is easy, and say I have pre-clustered things like the same way you saw the, this TSNE thing. So I just took a whole bunch of thousand maps and using the clustering algorithm to split those maps into smaller heaps. And each of these clusters becomes like a, well, like a line twig, I call it. So it's, it's in a way trying to pull out images out of the, that match this cluster out of the huge unsorted mass. And of course, it's best if I just show you. So this will take a bit, I hope, not too much. So I first say I don't use so many clusters for easy things. Let's just use nine clusters. And now I'm going to, to, to tell it, OK, I want, now to, to, to want you now to give me some, some maps, like find the maps in this unsorted bunch of images. So what's it doing now? It goes through those folders where I know these clusters, which I know contain maps, and learns kind of the, the features, or, or it, it really just builds these, well, it just assembles them in a way, and say so like these feature vectors, and, and builds these little clouds or magnets. And what you see on top is for a different type of detection, it's actually an average map of all the images that are contained in that cluster. So I'm just, because there are two ways of, of finding these images. One is by profile distance, where I take this 170, 27 dimensional vector and use a an distance between them. The other one is really a distance between the actual images where I subtract image, this image from the one that I'm checking and just measuring like how much difference is there. Okay, I think we have imported all the clusters. And now I'm analyzing actually this empty folder. So, and what it's doing now, so it opens every image, looks at the profile, and compares this profile vector with this, which is cluster, and looks in which cluster is the image which is closest to, to the one I, well, I'm just looking at. And then put, like, if there is no other image in that, in that box here or in this, uh, because it only contain like right now there's a maximum of 25 images I, I allow in each column. Well, if there is still space, if there's no image that is better than what I've already found, then put it in and then sort me the whole list by the distance, like by, so image A has a distance to that cluster of 10, so that's maybe good, so if, a, if an if another image comes in that has an even smaller distance, that goes on top. And let's have a look what happens. This looks like a map. Well, here, this category seems not to be so good. But again, it picked me out a map, a map. So, it, well, this category doesn't seem to be too good. But here, another map. And uh, it, it actually seems to work. And so yeah, now I can be happy. Say, OK, there's lots of things that I don't want. But whenever I find something, and now I have to do something not to destroy my tagging process, I have to go quickly into my training maps folder and rename. Oh, I have to quickly rename that. Because, what I, they, of course, it's not just nice to look at it, but I want to. Uh, so, so what I'm usually doing now when I'm, when I'm sorting out, I just click on it. And what it does, it copies me this map into, that f into a folder. I can just click, click, click. And whenever I've done that, that's already kind of classifying this as a map. Click. And some others, well, there's not too many maps in there, it seems. OK, here's one more. 
map, oh, map, map, map. So, and well, that process is really enjoyable and it works for, for <laughs> lots of things. And okay, so as you can see, it created this new folder and now all those, like those images that I just clicked have been copied in here. And what I can do next is I can just run another tool which says, okay, find me all the images which are in that folder and <coughs> take the folder name and tag on Flickr that image with the folder name. So usually what I'm doing is I'm putting all these uh, in here. This is the map folder. You have the maps <laughs> here. So all of the images that are in here, I can run to a second script and it will just automatically quickly tag them all on Flickr with map. And this works with all kind of categories. Um, I could, there's another technique which, oh, well, let's see if that works. So I have to actually restart this for a second. Um, what I'm also doing, I can look for very particular images. They just, because I, going through the big collection, I realized, oh, there's lots of these decorative elements in there. Oh yeah, that's, ah, I forgot to say that. That's the, the nice thing about sorting things. In the beginning, you saw this whole kind of unsorted mass. And when the human eye gets, or the brain gets drawn to certain kind of elements, and when it's so chaotic, you, most of the time you ignore most of the rest. But the more you sort things, the more you actually start appreciating the small differences and the, well, you start appreciating interesting things that you didn't think, like think, you find things suddenly interesting that, well, you didn't think before. And one of those things were those decorative elements that are like legion in there. So let's do this quickly. How am I doing? Have I still like 10 minutes? Hmm? Six, seven? Okay, good. So I'm going again to my training set and I call this single elements and single elements, um, let's go to the creatures. So it's, I call it creatures because it's all these decorative elements which are somehow having like a, a dragon or some kind of uh, gargoyle or stuff. So ah, I should have reduced the amount of images per cluster. That's okay. So as you can see, this is again the average image. But because it's all the same image, but in, the, in this Fuller cluster, well, the average image looks like just like the image. And so you can see I have all these uh, I've kind of decorative elements which have a creature thing because, and there are tons of more, and I really like hap am happy when I discover, encounter a new type of uh, creature, but uh, I think I'm almost like, at least <coughs> probability tells me that there are not that many other creature-ish ones. And uh, well, in this case, I can use the, the nearest neighbor image distance measure, which means and it is a bit slower. It loads the image, and that's the difference. And then, again, uh, th this works much better with like actually a concrete one. So let's, and I have this one folder, and I hope that, yes, this should work. It's the, it's the kind of keep folder, I call it, because that's the other thing. When I'm, whenever I go through this huge unsorted list and I say I'm looking for maps, for example, then, uh, well, constantly it happened to me that I said, oh, but this is, this is a creature and I actually want to keep that, but my tool didn't allow me to, to do that at that moment, so I had to just let it pass. So I built this little key in there. Whenever I find something that doesn't fit the current category but I want to keep, I it will copy that image into my keep folder where in a way my stamp collection is with stuff that I'm currently interested in but will do later. So, and let's see, so now and that keep folder already contains a lot of uh, decorative stuff. So let's, let's zoom in. Ah, you see, it, almost this one here, for example, but not really. And, um, but the, the, oh, see, there's one. It found it and uh, uh, flowers, tons of flowers. This is, let's zoom out again. Oh, too far. Let's, so, and that's, that's pretty much that what I'm doing all day then, just watching <laughs> how, how things float in. And of course, while you're watching it, you constantly discover, oh, there is a, another element that has shown up like 10 times, but I have not built a category for it yet. So I usually put that into the keep folder and start building new categories from that. 
let's see, well, but okay, you get the idea. So, and whenever I find something that has not, I click it and it gets copied and later on I can classify it. But yes, I should move on. Oh yeah, results. We are already at the results. So yes, the results are, I don't know. I, I think, for example, there was this map, map tagging contest and I, since maps are so easy to find for me, uh, where is it, British Library. So as you can see, it's very kind of chaotic and uh, it always lands somewhere. But for example, here, this is my, my maps collection and these are all kind of, and e each folder contains uh, 3,000 images. Uh, five, no, okay, it's, ah, this is the cluster one, stop. Um, this one, no. This one, so you, you can see, it should say, 3,000 at the bottom. Ah, it's still loading, but anyway, you have to believe me, so each folder contains 3,000 items, and you can see it's uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So I found already like 20,000 maps using this technique, and well, I started all these other categories, but well, I'm, using, I'm going in a way in a chaotic way. Whenever I find a new kind of topic that I like, I I build a new category. So there's this whole world of, of crystals, for example, where, uh, come on, so where you have all these uh, things that have these geometric forms, which I really like. And so I'm starting to collect these, or, well, of course, what else, skulls, where's the skulls? Uh, skulls, always nice to, to collect. <laughs> and. Uh, well, and then there's this other thing I just started collecting recently. Of course, there's all these people, and I call it situation. And it's all, in a way, I'm collecting images that are somehow telling a story, or uh, like where I would say it's, yeah, it's storytelling. And uh, so, yeah, it's these typical Victorian images. And actually, they, they can be picked out rather easily because, I don't know, they have some features in there which which make them distinct from machines or also portraits and stuff. So, because then there you have portraits and these things where people, I think it's when people look straight into the camera or so, then it's not storytelling, but if somebody turns their head to the back, then it's a story. I don't know, I can't really say, but I find that really fascinating and want to explore more. Uh, I also came across these recurring themes, uh, the creative elements, yes. There is the lost at sea, the open door, and dramas in bags. Let me quickly, <laughs> let me quickly show you. Okay, lost at sea is quite, quite obvious. It's all these. Yes. But yeah, I, I really like the open door because the open door means like somehow nothing good comes through open doors. It seems. Uh, so. I don't know, there's always, like, ooh, somebody is, like, poking in. Okay, sometimes it's just a, what's it called, a stepmother? No, but, yeah, it's usually horrible things happen. No, okay, not every time. But, or it's just somebody watching. I, and, uh, and, yes, also in beds, of course, beds are really bad because usually people just, they die in beds or they are sick. So, really, yes. So, yeah, and it's, yeah, it's so much fun. And then, of course, the more you sort, oh, I, know, I mean, the more you sorting these things, the more you suddenly discover these, these new things. What else? Ah, oh yeah, if I still have time. Okay, there's this other issue. Well, if you want to use the material for collages or for other things, well, you always have the problem that there's all this text around it and uh, there's paper texture and stuff. So I started building my own cleaning tool and I think I'm running out of time to show it, but it's actually working not too bad. So you can see there's all text on the sides and there's paper texture and afterwards it has automatically cut out the text and in a way figured out what is the actual paper color and the, like subtracted from the, the rest of the image. and. Maybe later, if you want to see the action, it actually works pretty well, but of course only on that set that is, because it's been cut out by this OCR engine, somehow it knows what to expect. And of course it doesn't work with everything. Um, yeah, of course I want to also show what I'm doing actually with the stuff after sorting it. So one of the things is I really like it, like 
imagine, like, I find the idea that there is these one million images where people have spent hours and days on actually creating them, and then they just rot somewhere. So, and, and I could never, I mean, that, I, that's why I became a code artist, because I can't draw and paint. But, uh, somebody spent, well, uh, maybe a day or longer on creating this image, and uh, I just think it, it's, it's, it's beautiful as an object itself, so I just like to present them in a way like, uh, like, kind of like, that we can reappreciate them just for their being there and being beautiful. Um, yes, oh, I really like these kind of geological profiles. Well, the other thing is some of these um, Victorian drawings look to me like mangas, so I made these mashups between, uh, <laughs> like, and actually, I uh, hope nobody speaks Japanese because I, uh, I, I wanted to create something really dirty, and I don't know, so I went to these websites where you shouldn't go <laughs> and cut out the text, and it might, it might maybe, maybe I just accidentally said, oh, yes, so the, the mailman is there, but I have no idea, nobody. Or well, here, there are these two, two boys, and this guy looked to me like he was holding a, kind of a joystick or so, so I combined that with, uh, like, made it like, look like a screen from a computer game. Um, oh. Or, well, and this is, of course, the sorting thing. So this is, I really like that. So you have all these geological profiles. And I just like to have those picked out and ordered. So I call these, like, 36 anonymous profiles, just to really appreciate the work that went into them. Or here, this takes a little bit, is, uh, like, all these kind of boring rocks. Like, people drew, spent days to draw this one rock. And then it's just like, oh, you see a rock, and you go to the next page. And, well, these are really beautiful objects, actually, and if you, especially if you put them together. Um, oh, yeah, here again we have this collection of 16 very sad girls. <laughs> or, and that was for November, where I thought, like, mm, maybe I could do this <laughs> kind of guide for proper grooming. Because, yeah, you have, of course, all these portraits and lots of things. So that was, I didn't do it in the end. Yes, of course, with face detection, then you can go and find all the faces and here I was using the recognition API which apart from saying telling you that there is a face it also tells you tries to figure out the direction people are looking in all the kind of the three-dimensional angle so these are all sorted you can see it like so they are looking from the outside in and uh, I have the same and actually have that in bigger so you can <laughs> see that where we here yes so Oh, okay, well, they're good. So, yeah, so you, if I scroll over here, again, these people are all looking to the left, and the more you go to the right, they are all looking to the right. And, uh, and yes, then when I got 44, I just had the, it, the uh, face detection also tells you, like, how old they think the people are in the image. So I said, like, okay, show me people who look as old as I am, and I found that quite, and yes, oh yeah, and then uh, the other thing is I'm currently doing is I'm building this auto collage tool, <laughs> funny thing, and which in a way is like an inverse collage, so I'm taking the target picture, and then I'm uh, like just randomly loading all these images from the, from the collection and try to fit it in places where it fits best, and to cut it out in a meaningful way, and this is the more abstract mode. So all these imi are images are parts of, of something from the library. And it tries to, in a way, cut them out so they, they fit nicely. And at the same time, the color and the structure is like getting close to the, to the underlying target image. And here again, so yeah, if you look closely. So there is actually no part of the original image. It's really just all. Uh, in this case, butterflies and stuff. So in this case, it's not from the BL collection because there are not so many beautiful butterflies, but this is from the <laughs> Internet Archive. And, uh, well, actually, that's it. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Do we have one quick question? Is there a question? Otherwise, are we outside? Yes. You said that did you do all this on just your laptop? Yes. That's why I was uh, smiling when you said before. <laughs> Can I run it on my big machines, please? Yeah, we, we could we try. Seriously get some, some 
really decent stuff. Yeah, uh, possibly. It's really incredible the stuff you've got going on there. So. Thanks. I mean, uh, well, we definitely should talk. I mean, uh, I could imagine. I mean, oh, one thing I didn't mention. This is all written in Adobe Air, which means it's Flash. And uh, well, probably you have no, I mean, if I'm on other conferences, I always have to cover my head because it's a little bit embarrassing. But because it's building up on my kind of 10 years of coding, it's kind of, I didn't want to start from scratch. So, but yes, the algorithms can, of course, all be ported to the different systems, I guess. Yeah, I have to be careful about the machine because if I drop this hard drive, all my work is gone. I'm really bad with backups. <laughs> 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 is it no, no, it's not really. Okay. Yeah, so my kind of secret sauce image detector is not open source <laughs> because actually yeah, I didn't go into depth. There are some elements in there which I think are actually quite innovative, which I'm using not only, I'm also trying to analyze the structure of the image by doing. <coughs> kind of histograms on image segments and neighboring segment sizes. I have this idea that in a way, like if I have a big element close to a small <laughs> element that is different, then I have lots of same sized elements. So I'm also trying to pack that all into my histograms and, and matrices. So, well, we can definitely talk uh, in detail and I can show you more. Okay, thank you very much again, Maria. Thanks. Thank you.